Good. Thank you. Thank you, Reflections. That's good. Thank you very much. And thank you, Unity. I guess Unity is scattered all over the building by now, but wherever you are, thank you. We appreciate that very, very much. It was, it was beautiful. For several years, Jane and I served as ministers to people in the high plains of West Texas in agricultural communities and uh, in little towns there and little churches. And, and we learned that there are some words that farmers just seem to hold in disdain. And you learn as quickly as you can, and the quicker the better for your sake if you learn this. You learn to never use the word vacation. You just don't use that word. And now I notice that these people were gone more than most any businessman I've ever known on trips that looked to me a lot like a vacation. But you didn't use that word. So I began to listen to them. And uh, these farmers would say things like, well, I've got everything pretty well laid by, and I think I'll take off for a few weeks. And so the next time in, in Deacon's meeting when I was going to announce I'd be gone for what I'd been saying, a vacation, and being derided for saying that, I said, well, I've got everything kind of laid by. And I think we'll be gone for a couple of weeks, and nobody said a word. That was just, just fine. Well, we don't ever get things laid by around here, but Jane and I are going to be taking a vacation here starting tomorrow. And I'm going to do something that I've never done. I've lived 64 years. My dad never took a vacation, and it was just not the way I was brought up. And this is the first time that I have ever taken a vacation that I didn't do some other kind of work on. We've been going the last several years out to Golden Gate Seminary, and teaching eight hours a day, uh, four days a week during, during these times, and it just didn't seem right not to be doing something. But I've been advised that it's a good idea to let a vacation be a vacation now. And so I want to thank you in advance for that and to say how I take this opportunity to say how thrilled I am about our staff, about the people that we have working here. Each one of them does such a fantastically wonderful job, and they're so gifted, some of them so young, and I'm so thankful for, for all of them. And uh, especially now that Randy Von Canel has come, well, he's able to take over the preaching duties for these few weeks, and we'll be taking this time of vacation or taking some time off. And, uh, and then I'll be going to speak five times to the European Baptist Convention in Interlochen, Switzerland. This will be my third time to do that, and looking forward to that time of sharing with those folks, and wish you would pray for that. But just wanted to let you know, if, if you miss me, you know where we're going to be. That's fine. <laughs> to... We've been looking, well, last, last week it came up in studying the Psalms, and, and if you study the Psalms and the Proverbs, there's a word that comes up a lot. Now, it's a word that my mother taught me to disdain. In fact, she said, you never use that word. Now, I learned, learned later from the Bible why she said that. She didn't know why she said it. She just knew it was not right to use that word. She said, don't ever use that word. Whatever you do, don't ever call anyone a fool. And I'd always grown up kind of staying away from the word fool. That was, and yet I find it so much in the Bible. We, it came up last Sunday night as we looked at Psalms. Uh, more than 40 times in the Scripture, God calls people a fool. Or the Word of God classifies someone as foolish or someone who is a fool. In, Proverbs, in Psalms 53 and 1, you remember it does say that the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. In Proverbs uh, 28 and 26, it says, He who trusts in himself is a fool. And then in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, and this is where my mother got the idea you're not supposed to ever use the word. Uh, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, now, I've told you in years past that rock eye is more of a sound than a word. And it literally is a sound of clearing your throat as though to spit on somebody. It's, it's holding them in contempt. Anyone who calls his brother rock eye is answerable to the Sanhedrin, to the religious court. But anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of hell fire. What does it mean to be fools? Years ago, when... We had just moved here, I think, in 1974. I had a call from my hometown, and they said, Frank, we're going to have something kind of new this year. We're going to have an all-spools banquet on April the 1st, and you're the first one we could think of for a speaker. <laughs> and I never quite knew how to handle that, but God's Word talks about fools. 
more than 40 times it talks about fools. And I'd like to, from the scriptures we've read, just to kind of get a definition of what a fool is. A fool is someone who looks all too little to God. Someone who looks all too much to self. And someone who looks down on others. Psalm 53, 1 says, The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. When we think about people like that, you and I think most of all about, I guess, Madeline Murray O'Hare in, in recent history, of how she's known as a, a very well-known atheist. Uh, and one of her great big plans in years past was to have an atheist community. She really bought some land and set aside a place out in Kansas where all the atheists were supposed to come together. And they were going to have lecture halls where they would study about atheism. They were going to have their own hospital. They were going to have their own schools and their own kind of community thing there. And there'd be a, a retirement center for aged atheists. And that got my attention. I thought, what's it like to be an aging atheist? I mean, you, what do you do? Just sit on the front porch and rock and think about the fact that old atheists never die, they just go to hell. I mean, wh what do you think about as, as an atheist? Well, Madeline Murray O'Hare was very upset several years ago when our astronauts were circling the earth and looked down upon the earth and were moved to read from the scripture. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And that disturbed her so much that she began to really speak strongly against ever letting that be done again, trying to get a law passed to ever let that be done again. And, uh, and our, the Chamber of Commerce in the little town where we were living at that time, out in Tulia, Texas, T-U-L-I-A, Tulia, Texas, named after the Tule River, which is about that wide. But, but we, uh, we were asked by the Chamber of Commerce to write a letter to Madeline O'Hare, Murray O'Hare, and protest what she had said. Well, I never really expected Ms. O'Hare to read the letter. The letter was going to be more for the benefit of those of us who wrote it, I guess, than, than of her. But I wrote her a letter. I decided to write her a thank you note. And, and, I, just, and I said thank you for reminding us that when this nation chooses its best and sharpest people for these kinds of, of uh, duties, that they're the ones who would look down and see the earth and say God did that. Uh, thank you for reminding us that we believe so much in the Lord who has done this. So we wrote her a thank you note. But the scripture says that a fool is one who looks all too little to God and does not say thank you to him about anything. In Luke, Luke 11, 40, Jesus is talking to religious people, uh, the people we talked about that Paul was and, and others, the Sanhedrin, the, the Pharisees. He's talking to religious people who were more concerned about how they appeared to be religious, the perception, than the reality. Uh, he read people's hearts, and he knew that what they were doing was not real. Their prayers on the sidewalks were to be heard by people. And so he said, if your goal is to be heard by people when you pray and people hear you, you've reached your goal, you've got your reward, that's all you're going to get. But if you really want to pray, get where only God can hear you and say your prayers to God and God who hears in secret will reward you openly. And this is the way Jesus talked to those people and to you and me constantly. He said, the perception is not the biggest thing. The reality is the biggest thing. And in Luke 11, he talked about them in this way. He said, you're like people who clean the outside of the cup, who keep a cup in the house that people that everyone in the family uses, and you clean the outside, but you let the inside of the cup be filthy and dirty and never cleansed. He said, why don't you clean the inside of the cup too because that's what's more important. And he said people who didn't understand that were foolish people who thought that the way you look is all that really counts and the reality is not that big a deal. A fool is someone who looks all too little to God and looks all too much to self. Proverbs 28, 26 says, he who trusts in himself is a fool. Do you believe that? He who trusts in himself is a fool. I hear a lot of people nowadays saying we trust in ourselves. Uh, the, the new kind of looking at life, the new age philosophy is that we are God. You know, that's not all that new, is it? Remember what what Satan said to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, uh, you'll be as gods. 
Why, you know, God doesn't want you to be as smart. He doesn't want you to know how smart you really are. You'll be like God. It's, it's time's oldest lie, and it's gotten more people into more problems, but a fool is someone who looks all too much to themselves and says, because it's in my gut, because it's in my heart, because I believe it deeply, that then it must be so, that just because I am real about this, it must be so. Proverbs 15, 5 says, he who despises instruction is a fool. When people look too all much to themselves, they, they don't want to be instructed. They don't want to be taught things. I, I've often wondered why it is, and I know that there are a lot of wonderful, wise, and smart young people, and our young people are among them, but there's always been young people in every generation who somehow were not wise enough to learn from those who went before them, but rather have to go all the way back to Eden and make the same mistakes and learn all over again. One of the greatest things that was ever done for me is when I was a young man, I got to be an assistant pastor to a wonderful, wonderful man. And he used to bring me in every Monday. And he would instruct me for four hours on Monday morning. And mostly we played, what if? He said, what would you do if this happened in church? What would you do if this member came and they said this to you and they were upset and angry? What would you do if this kind of tragedy took place? What would you do if your community was caught up in this thing and you had to say something about it? What he was doing was teaching me from both his mistakes and his successes. And he was helping me have more advantage over a lot of other young ministers simply because he was giving me his experience. I didn't have to experience it myself. It is a very foolish person who doesn't want to take instruction. It's a very foolish person who has to go all the way back to Eden and learn all over again what should, could be learned from other people's mistakes. And so it's, a, it's, it's someone who looks all too much to themselves who make that kind of mistakes. That's why education is so important is because we, we're learning from the experience of others. History should teach us to learn from the experience of others. Teachers teach us things that they have learned so that we can not have to learn them a the hard way. I have a a hero who's gone on to be with the Lord now. His name is Kenneth McFarland. There was a time when he was voted the outstanding speaker in the nation. He wrote the textbook that was the outstanding book for teaching people how to do public speaking. He was a vice president of General Motors. He, uh, he was a layman who loved the Lord very, very, very much. And he tells about how he got his first spark of instruction in a school. He said, one day at recess, in Caney, Kansas, where he was a little boy wearing overalls and no shoes and, and in recess at school. And he said that he just said to his friends one day, he sure would be glad when he could get out of that school. He didn't like it, didn't want to be there. And he said, the teacher took me aside and she said, son, there's a ladder on the floor of this schoolroom that goes as high as you want to go. But it starts here. And you've got to climb this ladder starting here. And she said, I hope that you never, that I never hear you again say you want to get out of school. I hope I hear you say that you're thankful to have a school to get into. It is a fool who despises instruction. It is instruction that helps us so very much in life to get along. And a fool who looks all too much to himself measures himself all too much by the things he can accumulate. Jesus in Luke 12 told the story about a, a very successful and wise farmer who one day surveyed his barns and granaries and silos and he saw his beautiful crop growing in the field and he said, this is going to be the greatest year I ever had. But he don't have an, I don't have enough storage facilities for him. I must tear down the barn I have and build a bigger one so there'll be a place to put this bumper harvest that I'm about to have. So he set out to plan to do that. And you remember that story. And, and the man was making his plans one night to build this barn, thinking about how wealthy he was going to be. He said to himself, I can congratulate me now. I have it made. I can eat and drink and be merry. I've got all I need to live for the rest of my life. And God came and said to him, You fool. Does it bother you to be called a sinner? doesn't bother many of us to be called sinners. After all, the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But how would you like to be one of the most prominent and wealthy and successful and respected people in the community and be called a fool? That bites hard at the swollen nerve of pride, and yet that's what Jesus called this man who thought that there was a barn big enough to store a soul in. Because you see, there isn't. 
There isn't a barn or a business or a bank big enough to store a soul in. This is a story of a small barn and a big fool. He looked all too much to himself and to what he could do. A fool is someone who looks down on others. It's amazing how often we find this statement in the Word of God, that a fool is someone who simply looks down on others. Let's look back again at the Sermon on the Mount in, in Matthew 5 about the commandment on murder. Remember, Jesus is saying to you Christians, now, the Sermon on the Mount is for Christians, and he's saying to us that we need to understand that the world needs to see us to outlive and outlove them. They need to see us being consistent with what we walk and talk, with what we say and do. He said, you've heard it said, don't commit murder. Anyone who murders is subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, is answerable to the Sanhedrin. But anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. That fool, that word fool, again, is the word moros. And we talked last Sunday night about how it means moral moron. But here's a different twist. The Bible says, don't you ever call another person a moral moron. Don't slander them. Don't talk about them. Don't put them down. Don't say evil things about other people. That's what he's really saying. You can do what my mother taught us to do and what she did consistently. She never used that word about anyone. But it's not just using that word. It's using that thought. It's putting someone down. It's slandering someone's name. Whether it's true or not, we're not to do it. For it's a thing that God takes very seriously when you look down on another human being. When you consider yourself superior to someone else, you're, being, you're acting the part of the fool. Don't call anyone else a moral moron. Don't put down other people. I read a thing once that if you see a man walking tall in a crowd and you know a tale whose mere telling aloud could cause that proud head to an anguish be bowed, it's a pretty good thing to forget it. And it is. It is. It really is. Paul said, if you stand for something, somebody's going to think you're foolish. It's true, isn't it? When you think about people who have made a difference in our world, somebody thinks they're foolish. I'm sure that Mrs. Edison's, that Mrs. Edison in the middle of the night would say, would call out to Thomas and say, Thomas, turn that light out and come to bed. Probably Benjamin Franklin's wife got mad at him one night and said, why don't you go fly a kite? Uh, somebody has always been a fool to someone else. But Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 10, I'm willing to be a fool for Christ's sake. I think I can tell you when I realized that God might use me in ministry. It was when I'd just gone as a very young person to this church I told you about as associate pastor. I had never been around professional people. I had never been in a church like this. I'd always been in rural churches where the most educated person there probably went to the 10th grade. I'd never been pastor of a physician or a teacher or a PhD or, or someone who was a lawyer or someone who was an outstanding business person. I'd never been around people like that. And I came to this church and suddenly I found myself preaching every Sunday night as the associate pastor did there, every Sunday night and every Sunday morning when the pastor was gone and then once again during the week to professional people. And it really, it really did get my attention. I was intimidated by all of that. And I remember the time in the closet when I was talking to the father. And I said, Father, I don't, want to anymore try to impress people. If it means being a fool for your sake, I will be that fool. If it means saying what I mean and it not sounding good to the elite, then that will no longer be a problem. I want to be a fool for Christ's sake. It was patterned after 1 Corinthians 4.10. The Apostle Paul said, I'm willing to be a fool for the sake of Jesus. Everybody is a fool to somebody. It's true, isn't it? There was a man wearing one of those sandwich board signs, you know, a big, big board in front and one behind, walking down Fifth Avenue in New York City. 
And on the front of the sign, it said, I am a fool for Christ's sake. And that's kind of unique a thing in New York City. And people saw him coming, they read that, and they, they were reacting in different ways to that. But as he walked on by, they reflected again because they saw on the back sign, whose fool are you? I think all of us have to ask ourselves, where do I draw the line? Where do I make my stand? Am I willing, like Paul, to be a fool for Christ's sake? And what am I going to be? Whose fool am I? Let's bow in prayer, shall we? Our Father, we're grateful to you that you give us the greatest living reason on the face of this earth, that we're about sharing a thing the world must know, and that those of us who go into, some of us into homes where if we don't tell it, no one will hear it, into businesses, in, into school, into life, into situations where people need to hear what we know about Jesus Christ. Lord, help us, I pray, to be wise enough to be willing to be a fool for Christ's sake. In his name I ask that, amen. Well, we come now to time of invitation, and we just want to let you know that you're welcome. That's what invitations are. They're extensions of welcome. We welcome you on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is his church. It's not ours, it's his. And he tells us to welcome all who would know him as Lord and Savior to come and be a part of us. We invite you to come and make that profession of faith. We invite you to come and plan to be baptized, to, to come and join our church, to be a part of us, to come in rededication of life, to come because God has called you to a particular task in kingdom service, and you'd share that with us to come for any reason for which God prompts you because doing his will is the most important thing of all and refusing to do his will is a very foolish thing. Let's stand quietly and reverently and you come now as we sing.